Okay, so now we're going to talk about nursing in the United States. And we have a lot of slides to get through. We're starting in the Civil War. In the Civil War, there were no available professional nurses at the beginning. Now, of course, if you've studied the Civil War, even in high school, you know that a lot of people died, for the same reasons they died in the Crimean War. It is because the conditions were deplorable. People died from things before they even got to battle. They didn't have socks. They had diarrhea. Um, they got gangrene from wounds, again with the amputations. Um, and so Catholic sisters were recruited to help to care for the wounded. It wasn't enough. There weren't enough sisters. There were eight different orders and they sent what they could, but there weren't enough. And as people became aware of boys leaving, uh, getting injured and not having access to any kind of care, they started to be moved to duty. The first of which, and the most famous of which arguably is Clara Barton. She was a school teacher. Um, she encountered some former schoolmates coming back from um, the battlefront who were grievously wounded and they had no supplies. Um, and so she collected supplies and stored them in warehouses and then she got to the battlefield where she would walk into shells. I mean, there are stories about bullets ripping through her sleeves. She was never, as far as I know, actually hit. Shells going off that tore off the bottom of her petticoat. She got right down and dirty with these soldiers and provided care on the battlefield. Um, after the war was over, she founded the American Red Cross. The Red Cross did exist, I think, in Switzerland, by, uh, founded by Henri Durand. If I'm not mistaken, I could be, I'm not looking at my references right now. Um, but she decided that what the United States needed was a Red Cross that could respond. They still respond to this day. They are very famous. You all know of them. Um, in any kind of disaster, you will see that very famous Red Cross. So that is the debt that we owe to Clara Barton. She wasn't as prolific a writer as Florence Nightingale, but she kind of was the Florence Nightingale of the American Civil War. Um, and she did have some support from Florence. We have Dorothea Dix. She's another famous early nurse leader. I hope some of you make a presentation on her. She was a superintendent of women nurses of the human army. So the army sponsored nurse training. And these nurses after the war was over were able to go out into the community and secure positions. Um, most of them worked in home care but she was another early nurse leader in the United States. Susie King Taylor, former slave. She not only cared for the wounded on the battlefield, but she taught some soldiers to read and write, particularly African-Americans who may not have had um, that education. And I'm mentioning Walt Whitman, although your book does not, I'm probably gonna write some kind of strongly worded email to the publisher because his exclusion in my opinion is really deplorable. Now during the Civil War. This is where the female angel of mercy image that is so popular in America, and it helps and hurts us, um, is sort of misleading. We think of these early women leaders. The truth is that most nursing care provided on the battlefield and in the battlefield hospitals was provided by men who for one reason or another could not be soldiers but wanted to serve the war effort. Walt Whitman was one of those people. You might know him as the renowned writer and poet who wrote Leaves of Grass, but he cared for wounded soldiers with just dedication and compassion, and people who were able to watch him work spoke nothing but praise of him, although he was criticized by some people who thought he was effeminate and perhaps gay, which was taboo in that time and in that place. And when the war was over, he wrote a couple of really important things. Um, if you have time, Google The Wound Dresser. It is a very poignant poem about what it was to be a nurse in the Civil War. Um, he actually has, I think it's the Whitman Baker Hospital, it's named after him in his honor for his contribution to nursing care and for a female physician who also contributed during the Civil War. But he was, um, an example of how men, for the same reasons as women, are moved to care and are very, very good at it. Professionalization and standard of nursing through licensure. So our pathway to respectability, you know, it came kind of slow. 
In the early 20th century, there were some efforts at licensure. The International Council of Nurses um, across the globe wanted each country and each state to provide for licensure of the nurses, not necessarily mandated. In 1903, there were permissive licensure laws. Nurses did not have to be registered to practice, but they could register and then they got to use the title of RN. If they wanted to be a nurse but didn't want to register, they just called themselves nurses and that was okay. They could still perform all the duties of a nurse. They just weren't RNs or registered nurses. By 1923, all states required permissive licensure. 1947, meaning when they when I say they required permissive licensure, they were required to offer it. They weren't require, requiring individual nurses to have it. In 1947, New York is the first state to fully mandate you cannot practice nursing without that credential. And in 1950, we saw the beginning of the state boards, which plague us to this day. All right, moving on to 1917 to 1930. Here's a World War I nurse from the Red Cross. See the little Red Cross band? So cute. Um, the challenges of the flu epidemic, World War I, and the early Depression era. So in 1917, the United States entered World War I. Soldiers returning from World War I were harboring influenza, which became bigger a part of life than COVID has for us. It was the same situation, shutdowns, reopenings before people were ready, and there was no vaccination at all. <clears throat> people were dying um, there are really, really good books. If you want me to recommend some, those of you who have the free time and you are interested in this, please ask me um, what it was like to be a nurse during the influenza epi epidemic or pandemic. The National Committee on Nursing was formed. It was charged with supplying nurses for all of these folks. Nurses needed to go to war. They needed to stay home and care for um, people when they returned and when the flu epidemic. We had the first Army School of Nursing. Um, and then the Vassar training camp for nurses was the first training camp under that Army School of Nursing. Red Cross nursing um, promoted education domestically for home care. It helped with hygiene. Um, and in 1920, Congress passed a bill that provided nurses with military rank if they chose to serve. Those are some things that happened in 1917 that were notable. Um, and then in 1931 and 1945, we have some challenges. So the Great Depression comes. The hospitals have their schools of nursing under that diploma model that we discussed, and they're using them as free labor, so they're not employing nurses. They're cutting back on the amount of money they want to spend on nurses, and instead they're using this free pool of labor that they have and making them work 16-hour days, six days a week. Um, so they're not able to find employment in most hospitals. It's kind of scary if you think about it that all the care in hospitals was provided by people with virtually no experience that didn't have the credential of RN yet, but okay. Um, and now families that used to employ nurses inside the home as private duty nurses could no longer afford to do so and elected to take care of their family members themselves. So a lot of nurses who spent a lot of time becoming educated no longer could find jobs. Um, in response to this, President FDR promoted the Civil Works Administration and gave jobs for public health. Remember, you have families that not only can they not afford private duty nursing, they can't afford hospital care, which was like a fee for service type deal at that point. They couldn't afford physicians and their health suffered. Malnutrition, overcrowding, um, poor sanitation conditions existed throughout the Great Depression and there was a need for nurses to visit these homes and families, particularly the ones that were hit hardest. So the Social Security Act of 1935 promoted public health nursing um, and provided medical care for people who could not afford private duty nurses under federal funding. World War II, now there are new challenges and opportunities for nurses. This is one of my favorite posters, fighting men need nurses. Um, there's now a booming demand for nurses and a lot of people have given up on the profession. They're not going back to school. <coughs> So we have a reduced number of people who can serve in this capacity. At the same time, the same pool of eligible women who could become nurses are being tagged to take the place that men are leaving vacant when they go to war. So like Rosie the Riveter, if you remember that kind of portion of history, they had lots of opportunities. They didn't have to be nurses. 
so now we have a shortage. Nursing has been plagued, and we'll see it in this presentation, by cyclical shortages. In response to this, and this is kind of, you know, we could talk about this in class if you want to on Monday. In response to the shortage of nurses, there was a decision made by the government to create a role that required less time intensive training to churn out more nurses faster to meet the demand. So we now have the creation of the LPN role and licensed practical nurse role. Um, and then Congress enacted more legislation to provide funding for nursing education. There was the Cadet Nurse Corps. I'm going to show you a really cute picture of me and my Aunt Betsy standing next to a picture um, of recruiting poster for the Cadet Nurse Corps. Um, but this provided a lot of really valuable training to people. And they, they provided that education for free in exchange for the commitment to serve. So it was profitable for women to do this. Um, between 1943 and 1948, which were war years, 124,000 nurses volunteered, graduated, and certified for military services in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. So that was an important turning point for us, um, where the federal government recognized um, that we needed a robust nursing workforce. Then we have new challenges in the years, the post-war years, between 1945 and 1960. You guys will know of this time period as the baby boom. Men and women came home from war. Economy had an upturn. It allowed women to stay home and raise families, large families, um, while men were able to get a, a decent enough living wage in industry. So post-war, we have a large number of nurses trained under this Cadet Nurse Act, and they don't return to nursing. They prefer to marry and they have the means to do so economically and they have children. And, you know, at that time in our culture, it was considered preferable for women to stay home and raise their children. There was no infrastructure for childcare if you did not, um, if you worked and had children. And in 1947, Department of Labor showed that nurses were dissatisfied because they were paid really awful amounts of money, like $13 a month, and they had long hours and their working conditions were difficult. Um, so why go back to nursing when your husband's making enough money for you to stay home and raise kids? Um, and that may be a little stereotypical, but it was common in that 1950s. The baby boom did increase the need for a maternity nursing care and baby nurses. That was where my Aunt Betsy started. I'll tell you a little bit about her, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But she has a very interesting story, and she really colored my perspective on the historical aspect of nursing. Um, so we had all of these new moms and babies. Mothers stayed in the hospital for two weeks. And when they got home, a lot of times baby nurses helped ease the burden of child care um, and taught them how to properly care for newborns according to the standards at the time. Um, Cadet Nurse Corps sort of dissolved. There was no money for other training programs. At the same time, in about 1946, the Hill-Burton Act was passed, and it expanded hospital services to become like sort of the primary center for health care. This increased the need for nurses, and they were becoming in shorter supply. Um, because military nurses were fully commissioned officers, that was an attractive opportunity for career development. And in 1954, to meet the needs of the military, finally men were allowed into the military nursing corps. Um, so those are some changes that happened in those post-war years. Now, then we get into the, the Great Society of Vietnam and changing attitudes towards women and how does this impact nursing? 1960. Um, this is the era of specialty care and clinical specialization. This is when you started to see children's wards, pediatric, you know, psychiatric wards. Things sort of branched off. It wasn't just a nurse is a nurse is a nurse, and you could put her or him, usually her, in any specialty and expect them to perform. Um, nurses received specialized orientation to units at the same time. Because there was this shortage left behind in that post-war, those post-war baby boom years, Again, we see this backpedaling on the need for education and community colleges begin offering associate's degree programs that are cheaper, more flexible in terms of scheduling um, and churn nurses out faster. And this is why we have this multiple pathway 
entry to the profession that still gives us problems today. Um, in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid services expanded to compensate hospitals at higher rates and made that the primary work setting, which kind of makes sense when you think about where nurses are employed. These are the people who can afford to pay us. Um, so pros and cons to all of it, right? Um, Vietnam War. This is where um, we see nurses really expand their practice because they're going in, they're doing a lot of trauma care. In some cases, they are physicians, they're assisting physicians during surgeries and taking on those roles that used to be like a secondary surgeon. Not enough doctors in Vietnam um, need for nurses. So they were given a lot more autonomy to make decisions about patient care. No longer did you see a nurse who was considered submissive to authority. Um, but now nurses are allowed to have judgment and challenge physicians um, when needed. But coming home from the war, we did see rates of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, among nurses and soldiers. And nurses, a lot of times, were overlooked in this discussion of PTSD. People really considered the needs of the soldiers, but there are lots of good books about the experience of nurses. Um, they saw a lot of trauma, a lot of tragedy, um, and their needs were kind of neglected when they returned to practice. Now we're moving on through history. We're already kind of in things you might remember. Um, from 1983 to 2000, the challenges changed. Nursing always has to ad evolve to the adapt, uh, adapt to the evolving circumstances that impact healthcare. Um, we have HIV and AIDS, and that was a very interesting time. This is when I went to nursing school, when this was all sort of a scary thing. Um, we have life support technologies and decisions that have to be made on the basis of those and economic factors that changed the way nursing practice happened. So in the early 1980s, we saw the emergence of a disease called HIV or AIDS, acute, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And it was this mysterious thing that killed people and it was untreatable. And we didn't know how it was transmitted. <clears throat> People thought maybe if you were at the dentist's office, you could get it. Um, <clears throat> and there was this fear of contracting disease. And a lot of people who might have entered nursing kind of held back at this point and said, I don't want AIDS, so I don't want to do it. And you saw practicing nurses who would also maybe not practice to the standard of care that they usually did. I was trained in the, you know, the era of AIDS. Um, I went to school in the early 90s, like, started in the late 80s, but finished in the early 90s. And I would see some of these tough, hard nurses be really afraid to go into a room. Um, and at the same time, employers early on did not provide protective equipment, personal protective equipment. And they told us that using gloves would send a message to the patient that they were dirty and contaminated would make them feel bad. Um, and it took a lot of lobbying by the American Nurses Association and other nursing advocate groups to protect healthcare workers from the transmission of AIDS. So we saw the emergence of universal precautions um, and we saw equipment change. And all of this had a cost to the healthcare provider and there was a lot of resistance um, on the part of hospitals and other healthcare agencies to implementing this stuff. Um, but things like having gloves in every room that you guys are gonna take for granted because you never knew any different. Um, retractable needles, needleless access to your IVs. I mean, I remember um, giving IV medications directly with a needle into an IV port, and they had these sort of self-sealing ports. Um, IV catheters that were not, you know, would prevent sticks. Um, these were all slow to implement. Even things like the um, oh, vanish point syringes, where you give an injection and the needle retracts right into the syringe. Very slow to implement um, because they cost money. But it was that implementation that protected healthcare workers and allowed people to feel safe going to work. Um, between 1980 and 1990s, we had an, you know, a big increase in the amount of technology that was used in healthcare um, and life support. So one example of this would be uh, advanced directives came out. There was a patient named Karen Quinlan who had a barbiturate overdose. And because of modern technology, she was placed on a ventilator and allowed to languish for years. Her husband wanted her removed from life support. Her parents opposed it. It became a court battle that went on and on and on. And this poor woman, you know, who had no brain activity and no chance for a meaningful recovery, in the meantime, was laying in a bed 
hooked up to machines. Um, and so we saw a push to get people advanced directives. We started to take, to think about um, how we would handle end of life intelligently and compassionately. It was another big impact. Um, at the same time, in the 80s, there was a shortage because all of a sudden we have increased opportunities. More women are becoming educated, college educated. They can pick any field they want, engineering, science, business. Some of them wanted to work on Wall Street. So in the 1980s, we had shortages. At the same time, there were nursing strikes going on and it called attention to the fact that women were being paid less Nurses were being paid less because we were predominantly female. And as part of women's liberation, um, it drew attention to the fact that nursing was at a detriment. Fewer people became nurses. Fewer people stayed in nursing as they were allowed to move into other fields. Um, and so that led to a shortage. And then finally, the shortage was somewhat relieved, um, but not necessarily in a good way, through the implementation of managed care. And this happened in the 90s, early 90s. Um, and among other things, I mean, there were a lot of things that went with it, but recruiting unlicensed assistive personnel, so people who weren't even certified nurses aides, um, people who were called patient care technicians or um, nursing technicians, um, could for perform a lot of the functions, doing vital signs, um, doing AccuChecks, um, things that were traditionally always nursing. I mean, it has created problems in terms of delegation, in terms of oversight, um, and it did reduce the need for nurses to some extent, um, but it may not have been the most ideal pathway to shortage reduction. All right, we're almost at the end of this slideshow, but we're going to talk about the years between 2001, 2015, and we're going to take a break and talk about what's happening today. So this is post 9-11, post Hurricane Katrina, and... Then we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare reform. So 2001, World Trade Center, 9-11. Emphasize the need for disaster management. All of a sudden, we're caught with our pants down, and people realize we don't have a group of people ready to respond in an emergency. Now, the sad thing about 9-11 um, is that a lot of nurses in the city and in the surrounding areas were activated to care for wounded. There really were no wounded or very few. You either made it or you died. Um, so we didn't necessarily need a huge response in the healthcare system for that, but it did show us where we were weak. It was sort of a, like a light bulb went off. Like we really don't have an infrastructure for dealing with mass casualty. Um, and we need more nurses who are trained and available to do this. The Red Cross did, simply did not have enough people who could respond. Then in 2005, Along the same lines, we had Hurricane Katrina, and some of you may remember in the news, um, babies being airlifted out of neonatal intensive care units in Louisiana. Um, people set up in the football stadium, the deplorable, almost anarchy-like conditions that existed during Hurricane Katrina, again, showed us that we did not have enough nurses. Now, I was working on the floor, and I was pregnant with my second daughter when Katrina happened, and there were lots of opportunities if you could serve um, they were paying for you to go over there, but nobody could just drop their lives. So at this point, communities are starting to acquire emergency response systems um, that incorporate nursing and other healthcare providers that are ready to respond in an emergency. Um, and you can still register for those today. If you're an EMT, if you're you know somebody who's licensed as a professional in healthcare, you can serve your community as part of the emergency disaster response team. Um, most counties have that. Moving on, in 2010, you all know of Obamacare. It's the Affordable Care Act. It gets treated separately in a following slide. Um, it was signed into law in 2010, took about five years to implement it. It had an impact on nursing, which I'll discuss later. Um, and then in 2011, the Institute of Medicine issued their report on future of nursing leading change. Um, and it's interesting, the ANA had been recommending all the same things the IOM report did, but nobody listened until the Institute of Medicine, which is run by physicians, um, issued their famous report um, in 2011. Uh, again, we're gonna talk about that later. And then we had information and medical technologies continuing to evolve to make care safer and better. Um, Barcoded technology, uh, smart pumps, insulin pumps, 
Um, and they're available and they're, you know, kind of accessible and they've been adopted as part of meaningful use by a lot of hospitals. We had live video monitoring for patients at risk for falling, um, which reduced the need for staffing. And then we have genomics, which is a whole course you're going to take and how that has influenced nursing and medicine. Um, that is me with my Aunt Betsy. We are at the Smithsonian. And I titled this picture, Three Old Broads Say Be a Nurse. There's my Aunt Betsy. She died this past October at the age of 97. I went to her memorial service in November and was struck by the number of people in her community who remembered her as a nurse. She became a nurse in during that baby boom. She was in nursing school during World War II. And I do believe she got funding through the Cadet Nurse Corps, but she got her bachelor's right off the bat. Um, and she went into maternity care and then later public health nursing. And then she became a professor of nursing first at Duke University and then later at University of California, oh no, sorry, Cal State Chico, California State University of Chico, where she designed the first program for public health nursing there. Um, and her students actually spoke at her memorial about what a driving force she was, not only for her students, but in her community. And she was loved by almost everyone. She is the inspiration for my life. But here we are next to that recruiting poster. I hope you enjoy that image. Sorry for the length of these videos. I'm doing my best, but there's just so much stuff. All right, we'll pick up again with one last video. It's shorter than the others.